Thank yeah. you. Dr. Giselle, you can start. Good morning to everyone. Dr. Nicholas Antao, our Managing Director, and all the trustees of the Biomedical Ethics Center wish to extend a warm welcome to all of you who have taken time out this Sunday morning to be with us and to listen to our esteemed speakers on a very unique topic, that is dental ethics. When I sent out this invite to many, the question I was asked is, what, is FIAM stand, what does FIAM stand for? So the letters F I A M C are taken from the French name of the organization Federation Internationale des Associations Medicales Catholics. That means the World Federation of Catholic Medical Associations. And FIAM is made up of 80 Catholic associations. Our association, the FIAM Biomedical Ethics Center, was established in the year 1981 to study and to debate the ethical status of various actions. The FIAM Biomedical Center fosters and promotes a culture of life where everyone cares and respects the other from the beginning of life to the end of life. And in order to achieve the aims and objects of this trust, the center undertakes research work, conducts seminars, publishes various books and a newsletter called Touching Lives. Besides, it also conducts a certificate course in biomedical ethics in collaboration with Nirmala Niketan College of Social Work. The course is meant for professionals and also for laity, for social workers, for psychologists, for counselors, and other healthcare providers. Besides this, the center organizes ethics-based webinars on various topics in the healthcare scenarios. The latest would be the breast cancer awareness, the impact of brittle bones. We had the World Bioethics Day where we spoke on social responsibility and health. And today we are having one on ethics in dentistry. This topic is not much discussed, but we all agree that as clinicians, we have a moral obligation to render the best quality of dental services to our patients and to maintain an honest relationship with other professionals and society. So dental ethics plays an important and integral role in daily practice. And now without gonna take much of your time, I would like to introduce Dr. Loyola Korea, who has been really kind and gracious to moderate the session. Dr. Loyola, he graduated with BDS from the Government Dental College and Hospital Mumbai in 1978 and followed it with an MDS oral and maxillofacial surgery from the same institute in 1981. He has been a member of St. Luke's Medical Guild since his journey began. He had a private practice which was grooming in Bandra in Mumbai from 1979 to 1994. He then moved to Auckland, New Zealand in 1994 and started private practice in Epsom after completing his registration exams. And up till today, he's working, I'm sure, doing extremely well there too. The name of his practice is Caring for Smiles Dental Group. It was founded as a one small room private practice of Loy with Thelma assisting, embodying Catholic values and principles. This tiny practice has grown to a large team of 15 and continues to share Catholic values of care. Though just three on the team of clinicians and non-clinicians are Catholic, everyone is inspired to practice the founding caring for smiles principles that endure. Our daily decisions and consequent actions bear witness to our Catholic guiding principles of love and sharing the gifts we have been blessed with. This is his motto. Now, Dr. Korea, I'd give it, hand it over to you to take it on. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. It is a pleasure for me to join you all. Um, I always feel the pangs of separation. Every time I go to my practice, I feel the pangs of separation, having left Bombay and all of you guys there. And um, I think very fondly of my years there because those were the cornerstones of who I am today. 
It is such a pleasure for me to introduce uh, our first speaker, um, Dr. Victor Rodericks, because I created my first faux pas in dentistry on the table of 101 or whatever the number was um, in GDC when he asked me to bring a chisel to start uh, carving the plaster model. And I thought I had to go to the hardware store and buy a one inch uh, chisel with a wooden handle, which I brought next day and plonked it on the table. And I've never seen him laugh so loudly. But then that's how dentistry is. Dentistry is where we, uh, you know, we make our mistakes, we learn from our colleagues, and we ride the journey with them through all our years. Dr. Victor was an inspiration to me and to many generations of dentists who practice all across the world. His, He's been a, practice, a practitioner of great repute. And it's not only repute as in doing great stuff. He was an inspiration. I want to be like Victor. And uh, Victor inspired the people who he taught at GDC. He, uh, he inspired the people at the Indian Dental Association, the Bombay branch, and all across the country, Maharashtra State Dental Association. And he taught people that dentistry is more about the love and sharing between colleagues and patients and the community. And so if he was not playing at the Bandra gym or he was not playing at the gymkhana or singing at some club, he was in his practice inspiring people to be like him. Uh, he's been you know, the scientific board chairman uh, with the same excellence uh, as he plays his music and sings his songs. And uh, his manner of delivery of speaking has been uh, so captivating that uh, you know, it has inspired people to say, I want to be like him. So well, a man of varied tastes and talents, Victor is passionate about more things than just music and dentistry. Travels all across the world for the Olympics and for soccer. I'm surprised he's here at home when the World Cup is in Qatar. Um, and, you know, the choir, the St. Andrew's uh, Church uh, choral group and uh, all the, uh, the dramatics, Victor is an inspiration. It is a pleasure to give you Victor as our first speaker for this afternoon, this morning. Victor. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, can you see me? You have to put on your video, Dr. Victor. Not yet, Victor. One minute. Huh? Yes, we can see you, Doctor. Yep. Hi. Hi, Victor. Doctor. We are not able to pause the lovely thing you said about me. I don't know. What, you can't hear me. Yeah, yeah, now we can. Okay. We didn't Greetings hear you from what you said. Ah, I said that. You, you learn the art of telling of you Doctor, we aren't able to hear you clear. Noela. Victor, we can't hear you at all. Uh, oh, what's happening? Uh, Dr. Victor, your network oh. bandwidth is low. No, I check my network now. Just now, it's in. Dr. 
Would you like to put on the headphones, doctor? Okay, try that. I just asked them to get my headphones working. What is? You want doctor travel to start? Let me try and fix this. Now we can hear you. You can oh, hear me. Yes, Great. now you can. Great. Okay, greeting, Dr. Nicholas Antam, Managing Trustee, Orthopedic Surgeon par excellence, a human, humanitarian, if ever there was one, and a most helpful gentleman. Dr. Giselle, Trustee, Leading Dental Surgeon, and a wonderful, helpful lady. And of course, my dear friend and student, once upon a time, I'll take a little credit for uh, him doing so well. <clears throat> Our moderator, Dr. Loyola Korea, a leading dental surgeon who left the shores of India years back and, and foxed everyone. Nobody knows why he did it. And by leaving the shores of India, he, he left India that much poorer in the field of dentistry. I know many, many, many People who missed him, at the risk of his wife listening, many of the fairer sex missed him a lot, and they told me so. Coming to ethics in clinical practice, whilst being sympathetic, courteous, and helpful at all times, the dentist should be mindful of the high character of the mission and the responsibilities he holds in the discharge of his treatment duties. He must always remember that the treatment and the care of the patient depends upon his skill and prompt attention. And that is of paramount importance. The patient, you know, in the clinic, sometimes they ask these guys, who is the most important person in the clinic at any given time? And it has to be the patient. At any given time, the most important person. I don't know if Loyola will remember, but I don't. In college, when I was uh, in the hospital teaching, I used to insist that the doctors, whoever, we used to get a lot of people from the railway station, porters, etc. But they had to, had to. Address them by their first name. Not just call them, hey, under out. Aapka time hua. No. Because the patient from the, his very first contact with the uh, dental surgeon or the doctor must feel comfortable and must feel that the doctor is here to help him. Ethics is a universal fairness of whether or not an action is responsible. Because of the possibility of difference of opinions in the fields of medicine and dentistry, the governing body, body or state lays down a set of rules which have to be adhered to when dealing with patients and when running one's own, own clinic. This is referred to as the ethical code of conduct. In, in India, the dental council, with the sanction of the central government, have formulated a code of ethics, also called the Dental Council of India Regulation. Briefly, and the salient features of this code will be discussed. The doctor-patient relationship, as stated earlier, is based on mutual trust. But unfortunately, now, nowadays, this trust is a bit strained, especially, fortunately, not so much in India, but in some of the Western countries, where, in actual fact, the patient and the doctor are looked upon as adversary. You know, when the patient walks in, not so much as I, I repeat, not so much as in India, but very often they feel that, look, this is a fellow who's potentially likely to sue me. He's a potential litigant. Ethics 
is not static. It keeps on changing. Not long ago, it was considered unethical to advertise in any form. The size of your board was important, control. Not so today. Today, advertising is quite rampant. Open Facebook and you see a whole lot of indirect adver uh, advertising going on. But I'd say if they feel it's they're okay with it, they're okay with it. I personally feel that very often the dignity of the profession is let down. And strangely enough, I sincerely believe that this doesn't really help the doctor. Coming back, the two gentlemen, Beauchamp and Childress, enumerated four ethical principles in healthcare generally. One is beneficence, doing good for a particular individual. This is important because it ensures that healthcare professionals consider individual circumstances and remember that what is good for one patient may not be good for them. Now, this is very important, not only for the dentist, for the patient. Because you, you, you might get, get two friends or mother and daughter or coming together and with a similar complaint. And you might tell the, the daughter, you might say, you need this type of treatment. Mother, you say, you need some other treatment. And they say, we got the same complaint. Why we got different treatment? And then perhaps you'd have to spend a little time to explain the second is called non-maleficence, the obligation not to harm a patient. Now, this statement might be superfluous. You know, who wants to harm anyone? But this relates to an inadvertent harming, which has to be avoided. You know, when we we're in, in dentistry, when we uh, treat, at any given time, very often, we are a few centimeters, sometimes you not in a few millimeters from vital, from tissue of the mouth. And we are using instruments which can really trouble up there. It is our duty to see that we do not even accidentally harm the patient. It's very, very important. You know, it's, uh, there, there is no point in saying, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll brief, briefly tell you, Way back in college days, there was, I don't know if you all remember, the, the Dr. Shori, for some reason, he used to send all his VIP patients to me. And there was one gentleman who came and he told me to, Dr. Shori should tell you what to do. So he, he, he told me, apply some silver nitrate. And this was the third molar region. And when I did that, unfortunately, this gentleman was quite jowly. I cauterized inadvertently some of the soft tissue. So, a little while later, I got a call from Dr. Shori asking me to come down to his office. So, I went down and the gentleman was there. So, he said, Dr. This, and I, hello, let me go back. I told this gentleman, this is what has happened, sir. You know, you have accidentally cauterized some of the soft tissue which could trouble you for a couple of days. So Dr. Shori called me down. He said, what happened? So I told him what happened. So I said, I'm sorry about it. So he told me, Dr. Roderick, this patient is so happy that you were honest with me. Honesty with the patient is of paramount importance. Anyone can make a mistake, right? Nobody's got it. But it is very, very important should you make a mistake, you inform the patient. And I can assure you, I can assure you that human beings are very, very understanding. They realize that even they can make a mistake. So this is a long thing. Then there's autonomy. Every individual has to decide, has the right to decide what will happen to his own body. Choose freely. I might tell the patient that this is required. But the patient might say, uh, doctor, I don't want that treatment. I have a two choices, but I have to listen to the patient. I cannot insist on that thing, but I could tell the patient, I'm afraid 
that if I don't do this, I'm not likely to get any relief. And maybe the patient will go to another doctor, whatever. One should not feel bad about that. that that's the patient's choice, right? But the patient must decide when that, what you are suggesting, and he must be in agreement to what you are saying. And finally, justice. To give human dignity to everyone, regardless of who they are, their status of life or where they come from, whether they can afford or not, you must ensure fairness. In our clinic, we, we don't turn anyone away. I mean, no, nobody is ever turned away. If a patient comes with pain, he is attended to. If he can't afford, he is still attended. We might not go on and do bridges and crowns, etc. But we will make sure that the patient instant uh, problem, pain, etc. is looked after. I'll, I'll go a little further and say that today, after many, many years, of course, we've been doing this for a few years or so. In the afternoon, that is after I leave the clinic, we run a clinic or we I term a free clinic, okay? Where, where, where the local, we have a lot of in Kolaba where I am, many of these uh, local guys, drivers, cleaners and all, and we do their work. That I have, I have an assistant, he attends to that. Should, for whatever reason, he feel that, look, I can't handle this case, then, then he will call them when I am there. And we will do the treatment. Talking about this, now I'm showing off a bit now. Eh? <laughs> in the many, many years that I have been in my clinical practice, I have never ever been late. I might be late for a party. I might be late for any other thing, but not for my clinic. If I give, let's say I give a Giselle, an appointment at nine o'clock, I will be there at nine. Because way back when I first started, there was one Mr. Sequero who came to me and he said, Doctor, I should go to this person, but I'm not going there, I'm coming to you. So I said, he's a very good dentist, why have you changed? Why do you want to change? He says, he doesn't respect my time. Mr. Sequero himself was a businessman. He said, he doesn't respect it. So from that, that one statement made me realize that a patient's time is as important as a doctor. And this is, this is also an ethical practice one should follow. Respect for one's patient's time to say. Now, as I said earlier, a dentist must keep abreast with the changing time. If today's dentists and doctors of my generation, my generation, and not Dr. Loyola, he's far, far later, were practicing dentistry as thought to them, then we would probably be referred to as Stone Age dentists. There has been a sea of changes, both in materials and techniques used. And keeping abreast with these changes is an ethical responsibility of the dentist. You cannot say that, look, I was treated, uh, I was, uh, these are the techniques, etc. I used then. That's finished. That's no longer, even your sterilization methods have improved tremendously and we have to use that what is considered best for the patient today. We have to, of course, be one second. About this, we the dental surgeon should practice methods of healing founded on scientific basis and should not associate professionally with anyone who violates this principle. There are many people. I I was once giving a lecture, uh, and uh, the after giving a lecture for long, it was a keynote lecture. A gentleman stood up on the last, from the last, sitting way back, and he says, all that you have told me, I don't do anything of that in my clinic. 
and I've done 5,000 root canals and all success. And I don't do anything. I just, all what you have told me and all these things is bogus. So I, I said that the very little I can tell you, except for one thing, we should be exchanging places. You should be giving the lecture and I should be sitting on your chair. You know that. That's what, but there are people when uh, uh, you talk to them, they will say that, look, uh, I don't believe this. You can't do anything about it. Uh, Giselle, uh, if you feel any time, time for me to stop, you let me. Okay? Yes. I want to tell you something about a very strange case that happened, but it's related to ethics in dentistry. Go back May 1996, when I was chairing a meeting at the Asian Pacific Dental Congress, a doctor, American doctor said that he implied that the dentist can transfer AIDS to a patient. And he gave the example of one lady, Kimberly's Begalis. Kimberly Bagalis. Fortunately, I had read something about that. So I told the doctor concerned. I, I, I was moderating. I was a moderator at that time. I, I told the doctor, he said, you know, it was not actually the dentist who gave the age to the patient. It was a murderer. He, who happened to be a dentist. This doctor had AIDS and he knew he had AIDS, but that's not, that's not the big problem. He was considered a good doctor. He was, uh, they said, but they said that sometimes he used to become a bit careless. And when Kimberly, what was strange about Kimberly's case is that she was an 18 year old girl who had had no sexual contact with any boy or man or anything. No, no sexual contact at, at all. And furthermore, she had no invasive surgery except for the fact that she had two third molars removed by Dr. David Aker. And it was later found out, you know, that he himself was an AIDS patient in the third stage of okay. AIDS. And it was suspected, suspected now, okay, that Dr. H. Uh, Aker deliberately infected some of his patients. Now today, all of us know that if there's an AIDS patient, and I have an AIDS patient myself, you know, who, who have told me they had an AIDS patient. Now if today the, the doctor, suppose there's an AIDS patient, and I inject that AIDS patient. And very carelessly, after 10 minutes, 10 minutes, I use the same needle on another patient. The chances of transferring AIDS is next to zero. Because the AIDS virus is a very weak virus. Not so the hepatitis B virus. In fact, therefore, you find more dentists of fellow. More dentists being moved. Can you hear me? Yeah. Affected, yeah. More dentists being affected by hepatitis B than AIDS. So this uh, Kimberly Begalis case, of course, unfortunately, became a, a quite 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 a big case in America. But eventually, and there was a a move to try and make dentists declare whether they had AIDS or not, or any other contagious disease. The patient had a right to know. But uh, that was turned down by the association. And even today, the dentist need not tell uh, the patient. But on the, when, as a corollary, I must say when we as dentists do any work, which, are, which is a bit invasive, 
implants or anything. We will ask the patient if they have AIDS or not. But the patient has no right to ask you whether that is ethically right or wrong. And that, that, that's up in the air, you know. Uh, that's <clears throat> now we are coming back to less. Uh, another thing is we've got this dental doctor, not only dental doctor, who suffix the name and they do a whole lot of things, right? Like, let me tell you. You know, and which is not permitted. Oh. I'm referring lest I make a mistake. For instance, after your name, writing on BP as if it's a degree is not permitted. Which is very common, MRSH, member of Royal Society of Hygiene. It is not, but yet you'll find a lot of things. FAG, Fellow of Ac Academy of General Education. These are not, these are unethical, considered unethical. But <clears throat> people do it and do action is taken because perhaps uh, it doesn't really affect anyone. You know, no, but generally one is expected not to do, not to do these things. Now, coming back, a dental surgeon is, doesn't have to treat every patient who comes to him, right? But, as I said earlier, in case of an emergency, it's very important to treat, treat the patient. And as I told you earlier, my time is as important as the patient's time. A dentist, as I uh, Personal financial interests of a dental surgeon should not conflict with the medical interests of the patient. A dental practitioner should announce his fees before rendering treatment. Right? And he should try and avoid changing. I'll tell you, there was another... Uh, doctor who came to me and he said, Victor, I have a problem. He said, I was doing a thermolar extraction and I told the patient, I gave the patient, let us say, I'm giving you a figure, that he would be charged 1,500 rupees. I'm just giving you a figure, okay? But I thought that that uh, extraction would take a maximum of 20 minutes to half an hour. It took me three hours. So I'm going to, I want to charge the patient more. Can I? Can he? He can't. I told him you can't. There are two things out here. First of all, the patient didn't estimate the time you estimated. And, and secondly, if you have estimated the time, the panel, and you tell the patient, the patient will turn around. Doctor, why should I pay you for your inefficiency? If you think you could do it in half an hour and you take in two hours, then I can't. But Coming back to the point is once you set fees, right? And the fees should be discussed with the patient, especially if they are larger fees. And I would suggest that is worth giving, uh, telling in writing what the fee and the type of treatment you're using. It's also very valuable well on this, keeping medical records of the patient. I have medical records since 1975. You can ask me about any patient, or any patient, I won't tell you, but if any patient asks me about the medical record, it's all on the computer. The payments, the medical records, everything is on the page. Another thing, if you have the medical record, and if the patient asks for it, then you are bound to give it to the patient. Absolutely essential. You know, you can't tell the patient that there was a time when doctors didn't want to uh, think. But today, it's very, very important that you give the... What else? 
Another thing is claiming to be a specialist when you are not. I, 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 I think this is quite common, right? And uh, accepting money from pharmaceutical firm, etc., is a no. It's a rather sad thing to do. And it is definitely unethical. Now, I, I think I've spoken enough, Giselle. And if anyone yes, okay. has any questions, Loyola, anyone, I would be happy. In fact, if Loyola wants to continue and enumerate a few of his, uh, what should I say, uh, studies that he has done or incidents, most welcome to do so. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I think that's uh, wonderful. You've covered the topic quite well. Uh, I really appreciate it. And hearing you after all these years, brought back fresh memories of our first meeting. Uh, I move it on. We'll, I think we'll take questions and answers later. We'll okay. uh, have uh, uh, Dr. Trevor Pereira um, uh, come on. Uh, I'm uh, mindful of uh, uh, the time. And uh, so Trevel, uh, Dr. Trevor Pereira completed his graduation uh, from Nair Hospital Dental College and went on to do his postgraduate studies at Government Dental GDC uh, uh, in oral and maxillofacial pathology. He has about 28 years of clinical experience and 24 years teaching experience. Guided many undergraduate and postgraduate and PhD students for various national conferences. Authored about 130 publications in both national and international journals. Dr. Trevel is also a reviewer for numerous national journals, including the Journal of Oral and Maxofacial Pathology. He's also an executive committee member of the Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists. Presently, he works as a vice dean, professor, and head department of oral and maxillofacial pathology, D.Y. Patil University, School of Dentistry, Nero. It gives me great pleasure to uh, give the floor to, uh, to Dr. Trevor Pereira to cover ethics in marketing. And I think he means marketing, dental marketing. Thank you, Trevor. You are muted, uh, Trevor. Yeah. yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Giselle. Giselle is my uh, senior from Nair. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk on ethics and marketing. I was just looking at the participants and uh, I have my sirs who are there who have taught me. And um, I mean, I'm speaking on a platform where they will be listening to what I have to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Heyman, sir. Meshram, sir, for being there. And uh, thank you, Giselle. So I'll share my screen. Just one minute. Huh? Yeah, everyone can see that. Yes. My on? Yes, you are, but you're not in slideshow mode. It's in slideshow mode. Now it has changed. Thank you. Okay. So, 
So I'll be talking about ethics in marketing. I'm uh, Dr. Trevel Pereira, Vice Dean, Head and Professor of Department of Oral Pathology at the B.Y. Patel University School of Dentistry, Nerul, Navi, Mumbai. As we know, dentists are both healthcare providers and businessmen. While they work to preserve and improve oral health care, for their patients, they also cannot ignore the amount of profit they gain from such treatment that they provide. This professional identity is different from that of many medical doctors, as dentists are the owners of their own practice. So financial stability of their dental hygienists, receptionists, and dental assistants is dependent on how well the dentists run their business. And therefore, it is inevitable for dentists to think about the profit that they bring to their office. Now, there are many strategies a dentist can employ to build a professional and commercially successful practice without breaking the law. Advertising is only one aspect of marketing. And every business owner should be aware of how to market their business, even if they cannot advertise. So an advertisement is a paid promotion delivered via some media, like you can say either in print form or the television or radio. But marketing also involves a systematic business plan that takes into consideration the business as a whole including ethics and the culture of the community. So in India, many dentists use enticements such as comparatively low fees, some free checkups, complimentary gifts to attract patients. As with advertising, there is a risk that such methods could create a bad public impression and mar the reputation of the dentist. On the other hand, this can impress consumers, especially if quality treatment is provided with concessional or reasonable rates. The dichotomy between the dual role of the dentist as a healthcare provider and as a business entity is at the heart of the issue of advertising. Commercial goals sit at one end of the spectrum while the patient care and professional goals weigh in on the other side. However, business itself is not unethical. And the reality is this. If the practice fails as a business, the practitioner fails as a medical profession. So I think there are some questions we need to deal with. Is there something inherently wrong with selling professional skills and quality of health? Should marketing be allowed in dentistry? Also, should dentists be able to sell aesthetic products in their dental office that care for the general health of patients as well? Should there be any separation between general basic health care and aesthetic care in the dental office? Well, let's see whether we have some answers to the questions in the upcoming slides. So I will argue that while dental marketing ought to be allowed with a specific in, I'm sorry, that while dental marketing ought to be allowed with a specific intent, with a specific intent to bring patients into the dental practices, there also has to be an obvious prioritization of basic health care over aesthetic services within the practice in order to maintain a healthy patient-doctor relationship. Now, we all know that marketing is not all about business. Sometimes, sometimes it is a public health movement. Marketing in healthcare has been a topic of ethical concern since 1970 when patients who were primarily physician referred could now choose the healthcare services based on their own preferences. 
the dynamics in medicine changed when free marketing was permitted. And if the dentist did not put their name out to the public, there was no way that patients could find it. Thus, so even if a dentist is culturally competent and professionally adept, if no patients can find them online or on newspapers or billboards, their skills and well-intended deeds would then be put to waste. Now we all know that dental anxiety and phobia is mostly related to the patient's own traumatic experiences or vicarious learnings through their friends or family or through the media. This fear and anxiety leads patients to believe that something awful is going to happen during their dental appointments and therefore they could refrain from visiting a dentist. So such a behavior could be harmful to their oral health, leading to more missing teeth, decayed teeth, or a poor periodontal status. So these patients visit the dentist only during an emergency, and these emergency treatments can be more complicated or traumatic, thus reinforcing their fear of a dental practice. So hence, it is important for the dental community to bring in these patients before they reach some harmful stage in their oral health. And dentists can do so by effective marketing that fights against the distorted image of dental practices and that increases the public understanding of dentistry. But dental marketing, therefore, is morally per permissible and even required when such advertisements increase the awareness of patients and ultimately protect their oral health. In fact, it would be unethical for the dentist to not market themselves when their practices purely serve the people and well-being of their health. As the professional obligations of dentists not only lie within the patients that come into their office, but also within the general health of the community. So hence, the ethical marketing is derived from the intent of the dentist, the one that hopes to preserve and improve the oral health of patients. Nonetheless, not all of dental marketing is ethical, especially those that prioritizes profit over the basic health of the patients and those that bargain with the people's health. Who is at fault when the seller is deceptive and the buyer is naive. So Thomas Carson in Lying and Deception says, theory and practice offers a perspective that perhaps it is the buyer and not the seller who has the responsibility on the decisions that make to either buy or not buy a product, which is also known as the caveat emptor. If the buyer is so stupid so as to believe what he or she is told, then he or she deserves what happens to her. But such claims suggest that it is morally permissible to take advantage of the unknowledgeable customers and that our community should be built on skepticism instead of trust. So by extension, uh, responsible patients in the dental practice are those who do not trust their dentist because dentists are morally allowed to trick their patients for profit. There are two reasons now why such an argument is flawed. So according to Carson, no one can fully embrace this view as everyone is vulnerable against being naive and unknowledgeable in the fields outside their specialities. And who would want to deceive them in return? Therefore, deception and withholding information is immoral. And on the second hand, the weight of deception in healthcare is much higher than that in any other business. So before any dentists are businessmen, they are still healthcare providers and ought to allow patients to make an informed consent, thus giving them control over their body. So according to the American Dental Association Code of Professional Ethics, the dentists may participate in marketing as long as they do not exploit the trust inherent in a dentist-patient relationship for their own financial gain. So in regards to the dental patient 
dental related products dentists must not just rely on the manufacturer's presentation of the product instead the dentist have to understand the safety and the efficacy of what they are selling and explain fully about the dental product to the patients without any bias towards the price tag hence it is generally agreed in dental profession to prioritize patient health over financial gain and any sort of deception and withholding information in practice or in sales is morally impermissible as people have the right to know what is being done with their body thus so i argue that dental marketing is ethical as long as it is in the best in the patient's health and dentists have no intention of prioritizing profit over someone's well-being perhaps the selling product in dentistry is not one's health it is the dentist skill education and the labor that advocates for the patient's well-being in the end therefore dentists are not bargaining health for profit if they market honestly as they are just advertising their skills and experience that would bring good for the society in the end so marketing in dentistry can be ethical when the dentist's utmost priority lies on the good of the patients and their health while the business cannot be ignored if the dentists are genuine to the people that work they work with most patients would trust their dentists and return back to the office allowing them to make more profit that is enough for living so in the end what is more ethical is what advocates for the patient's well being in order for dentistry to promote this good this they ought to reach out to the public through effective and educative advertisements while explicitly prioritize prioritizing health over aesthetics and money ju thus justifying the demand and supply rule of a marketing principle so while dentistry does not deal with life and death situations like mainstream medicine preserving the oral health is crucial to product to protect the person's overall health poor oral hygiene may lead to cardiovascular diseases respiratory diseases and even diabetes then is dental marketing morally impermissible because it is also selling a people's opportunity for good health think about this thank you let's see if there are any more questions now to be asked very concise very excellent i appreciate that very much uh we now move to the question and answer session so uh, if anyone has a question for either of the speakers how will will you be posting it in the chat Zell, yeah, how will the questions? One is put it in the chat, and one is that they can probably put their hand up, and you know. Yep. But you could just feel free to, yeah. Yep. The participants uh, can unmute by pressing the space bar on a desktop if you want. and uh, or raise your hand and then you can ask a question i think the first question i first hand i've seen is um, dr john paul yes, yes dr john paul good morning to everyone and thank you victor and uh, travel for the uh, wonderful uh, points that you all have covered uh, it's very nice uh, and we uh, all being catholic doctors you know uh, and we know that from the point of view of our faith we have to work in ethics always money is not our only criteria 
So ethics is very important and hence thank you for this lecture. Uh, I have one question only for Dr. Treville. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Travel, now, you know, uh, you, you spoke very well. Thank you very much. Uh, but I think you spoke a bit about marketing and what all can we do justifiably for the good health and the betterment of the quality of treatment to be given. But does the, our dental council allow it? I mean, it's something like which is ethical and which is lawful. Ethical, okay, that we will do surely. But I would like to uh, address the same point of marketing from a legal point of view, from the dental council point of view. Can you just answer it? So, uh, see, according to the Dental Council of India, marketing is not unethical as long as it is done in the interest of the patient. So, yeah. can be, there can be a very thin line that can divide this uh, statement because uh, I... To tell you frankly, if the product that is being marketed is time tested and it is, uh, you know, it has been, uh, uh, trials have been done and then it is marketed, then there is nothing wrong in it. But you find billboards, you know, many dentists putting up saying that they are offering cheaper treatment. They are, that kind of mar marketing is unethical. But if you want to market a product, like you want to market a toothpaste or you want to market some new implant system and that has been tested. So then there is nothing wrong in marketing unless you don't market it. How is the, how are you, how are the patients going to be aware of the availability of this product? Yeah. yeah travel, you finished? Yeah. Yeah. Travel, that is as far as marketing a product, but you started with the thing that a dentist should be known to others as to what services he's providing. He should be known. People should be able to find him maybe on YouTube or any other uh, social medium. Like there are these, you know, we get these books and, you know, all the things. And if you're in Bombay, which doctor? Can... So is that allowed as far as the dental council is concerned? Well, I don't think there's any rule that says you cannot uh, market yourself. So, John, uh, I mean, you have been, you're much senior to me from, uh, uh, from Nair. And, you know, during the time when we started our practice, so I, I, I practice in an area where now there are more than 100 dentists. Okay. But when I started my practice there, I was the second dentist. And it took me just about maybe a year or two years to pick up. And I was known. In fact, I have, I mean, I have a three chair practice and it is, I don't market at all. My work spreads by word of mouth. But with the newer dentists coming, when there is so much of competition and there are so many dentists around the corner, if someone wants to, I mean, ethically promote himself by saying that, okay, I'm, you know, this is the work that I do. I don't feel anything is wrong in that. I don't promote myself. That's because I'm 25 years in practice. But I'm sure people who are the newer dentists want to have an edge or probably they want to do, they want to say what they kind of work they do. So I don't think by putting up a board or by, you know, telling in, a, in, in an ethical manner, you advertise yourself. I don't, I don't feel that's wrong. This is my take on it. Thank you, Travel. God bless. Uh, the next question, uh, we have Cheryl's hand up. Cheryl, you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is for Dr. Victor. Dr. Victor, I know you said uh, coming to the pharma companies, okay, yeah, definitely taking money from them is a sure no-no. But uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So we at St. Luke's, we ran a, a St. Luke's study and we kind of use these pharma companies as in they sponsor a lunch, a meal, and we do an educative forum. So we do support them and we believe their I, products are good. Idea are doing this every day. Okay. The Indian Dental Association, Dental Council, they all their colleagues sponsor them. I was in the Dental Council of India. I was with the IDA, right? And uh, we knew them personally. They would come and sponsor uh, an event, right? And yeah. They don't, they don't give you, I'll tell you something. Pharmaceutical firms have come to me and offered me money, right? They've offered me trips abroad. I have not accepted. Right now, 
I, I uh, understand where Dr. Travel is coming from as far as this marketing, etc. is concerned. But out here, what happens, the dentist market, marketing himself will always say he's the best. I want to know which dentist will say I'm marketing, but perhaps there's another dentist who will do it better. They won't say that. So when a dentist markets, what is he saying? I'm the best. But tell me, in my opinion, if marketing is not wrong, and parts is not wrong, then we should ask the IDA and the Dental Council of India to market dentistry per se. This is not marketing of dentistry. This is marketing of an individual. That is the difference between marketing dentistry, let the idea do it. Let the Dental Council of India do it. But if I do it, what am I saying? Victor Rodriguez is the best. Victor Rodriguez is going to give you treatment cheaper than other dentists. Or oh, Victor Rodriguez, this, that, in my opinion, is a no. We've got, we've got uh, the idea, we have got associations. Allow them to do it. We should go to the association. Please market dentistry. Please tell them that these things are possible. Even give them, allow the idea to give a price range. It's not difficult for them to do. Right? But for me to say, hey, I'm the best. That's what I feel. But I must also add something. I'm a bit old-fashioned. Thank you, Victor. Appreciate yeah. that Thank you. insight. Let me share. Let me share with you. I think this is a great point at which I thought something came to mind, and I thought I would share this with uh, with with everyone on the on the team. See, when I uh, started my practice in Bandra in 1979, I was Frank Correa's son. I was an ex Campionite. I was an ex Xavierite, and I was an ex Mount Abu boy. And every parent or every family member knew that. And they would start referring patients to me that kickstarted my practice. Gradually, my work began to speak for itself and it went from there. But when I moved to New Zealand, I did not know a soul. I started a one room practice. And my biggest dilemma was that everyone around me had very deep pockets. It used to cost, people would take these large advertisements in the, in the yellow pages and some of them would cost as much as 27 to $30,000 for a one page in, in the yellow pages. And I could not even afford uh, one inch by one inch. So we had no patience, you know, moving to a, to a country where the rupee gets divided by any number is not enough money. So I began to, I, I began to think, how, how do I do this? So as a patient walked in, the first patient, I began to take high, uh, you know, photographs of their teeth and I used to have a software where I could show them photographs of before, during, and after. And then I would talk to them. When, when they came back in the next time, I would take a picture of that tooth. And I would say, you know, we did this amazing job for you six months ago. It's looking great. And, you know, I hope, you know, you, my practice can only grow if you tell people. Dentists don't, I, I lecture in New Zealand as well. Dentists don't ask their patients for referrals. If I ask all of you, when did you last ask a patient? When did you say to a patient, I appreciate you being my patient. I appreciate the fact that you come to me for care. I would appreciate if you send me your family because I would like to look after them as well as I look after you. Less than 1% of my audience anywhere, whenever I've asked this question, have put their hand up to say that they follow this routinely. Less than 1%. The most ethical way of doing marketing is word of mouth, but how do we do it? That is really the most important aspect of, of, of marketing. Talk to the patient whom you have delighted and ask them. Express gratitude and ask them. In that way, you will find your practice is is future-proofed, it is competition-proofed, and you would only have word-of-mouth marketing. And that's how my practice grew in New Zealand. 
because people are always looking to help you when you ask them. Uh, a question for Trevor, uh, how does it work if dentists start using high-end personalities and famous personalities in their marketing? And, uh, you know, they, they say, well, Salman Khan comes to me, here is me with his photograph, I did all his teeth and, and you, you, you put it out there. Is that fair? Is that ethical? So um, I, I agree to the point that you said that, you know, you're practicing in New Zealand and you, you know, the kind of way you promote your work is by word of mouth. So uh, that's the way I started my practice. I mean, there were just two dentists in a place called as Airoli, which is in Navi, Mumbai. And nobody had ever even heard of this place. Okay. It was like, now it's on the map because it's a major IT center in Navi, Mumbai. But uh, at that point of time, nobody had heard of it. And it was my work which spoke. So uh, as time goes by, the number of dentists increase. So um, uh, when you coming to your question, when you say is marketing with these kind of um, uh, film stars, is it ethical? No, I don't think that is ethical. But advertisement has its role in one way. And the way they do it, it is for a centralized body to decide whether it is right or wrong. I mean, as an individual, I cannot comment on that. But if there are rules and if you follow the rules and if it is done in an ethical manner, then I don't think it is wrong. So many of the things here in our country, our rules are made and they are broken. So I, I really cannot comment on that because, I mean, it is difficult to talk about it. You people say that you can't do such things. Marketing is not allowed, but it's done and it is, it, the person gets away with it. You see so many products being advertised. Nobody says a word about it. Okay. But one fine day, somebody does some marketing somewhere and that is pointed out at someone, some doctor puts up a board saying that I do something, the cheaper work that, that is pointed out. You'll find some counsel pointing out a finger of them and telling them to get that board down. At the same time, you have the same product, which is pro uh, a similar thing, which is done on television, where you have uh, film actors marketing their marketing a toothpaste or marketing some design or something, and nothing happens to them. So there are two ways to it. You know, it depends on how. Uh, if someone wants to really push you down, and if they have a high hold in a society at that in that, those areas, they push you down, and that happens here. You know, so there is no set rule. There is no set rule that can tell you whether you're right or wrong. Yep, I agree. You know, one of the things that I, I thought is we, we constantly uh, talk about um, doing, un, you know, treating others as we would like to be treated ourselves. And over the years, I've realized that um, I have to treat others as they want to be treated, not as I was treat, would treat myself. And in part of my conversations with colleagues, I found that, for example, a patient might choose to spend uh, a very large amount of money on um, saving a tooth, which the dentist might not do, or the dentist might choose to have it extracted but sometimes they don't present that to a patient because they judge the patient's decision making by their own bias or criteria. What do you think about treating a patient the way they want to be treated rather than how we feel we want to be treated? If I had a toothache, what would I like want done for me as different to how a patient would like to be managed. Who would like to answer that? Yes, Victor. Trevor, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Loyal, I touched on this, right? Slightly. It is paramount that you eventually do what the patient wants. You can tell the patient, look, in my opinion, this is best for you. If it were me, I would have done this. 
right? This is what considering your age, etc., etc., etc. I want. But if the patient says that, look, this is I want this particular type of pain. That is their choice. There is there is no getting away from that. There is a danger of not doing what the patient wants because for whatever reason the patient is not satisfied. He tells you, doctor, this is what you insisted on. I didn't want this. That is a, of course, if the patient, I've had patients who have come and said, I want all my teeth removed. Perfectly good teeth. I've not done it. I said, you can please, I'm sorry, I can't do this. You can go to someone else. And perhaps it, uh, someone else will do it. But otherwise, presuming, always presuming, that what the patient is asking for is not drastically wrong. I, I think there's no, there's no answer. Yes. Thank you, Victor. So I'd like to add on this, like like uh, the same thing that you said, Loyola, that, uh, you know, uh, I, I usually don't agree to what the patient wants. I mean, if I feel that the, the uh, protocol for the treatment is like an extraction has to be done, it has to be done. Like if the patient doesn't agree with what I am saying, I would probably tell the patient to go and visit some other dentist because uh, there have been situations where I have agreed to what the patient says and over a period of three to four years, something may have gone wrong if the tooth was periodontally weak and I had tried to preserve the tooth and yet there was damage. I've had the patient telling me that you insist, I mean, you know, you have done the treatment, but uh, you know, we don't, we don't have such extensive record keeping that like the way y'all have it there. And so I would probably not have it written in my records that the patient, like I had wanted the pre teeth to be removed, but the patient insisted on keeping the tooth. So that record maintenance is something which we have to improvise on. I don't think we do keep details of what the patient treatment is done, but recording statements about what the patient wants to do and what I found necessary at that point of time, that is never recorded. So that's my sorry, but uh, yeah, I do that. I record those things. So if you have all yes, yes. Okay. And put on the computer. Okay, that's good. I, yes, patient has been advised this, right? Patient and this, and not only is it on the computer, it's dated. Okay. Right? And it, it's a very, very simple method of uh, oh I agree, I agree. Because, because travel, this happens very rarely. Yeah. It's not an everyday occurrence. So to make a note of this is not difficult. It's not difficult. I agree. for you. Who, as you say, you have got a quite a lucrative three chair practice, then there, there should not be a problem. True, true. It might I, be a problem to someone who doesn't have help. If obviously, if you've got three chair practice, you've got even uh, much, uh, clerical help. So it's not difficult for them. We'll take what, a next, we'll take a next question. question. Let me tell you that sometimes the patients come and patients don't know. They come and say, Doctor, the crown that you have put has broken. <laughs> Um, the lady helping me will let one go into the computer and tell him this was done 20 years ago. Not that we won't do the treatment. We will do the treatment. We will still, but the patient must realize that, look, this is not something that has happened yesterday or day before. 20 years ago, passage of time is important. Not only could we run faster 20 years ago, you could walk faster. Everything changed. One of the things I, I think it's, uh, we've got a few hands up, and, uh, but I thought I'll get a sentence in here. Victor, in an answer to your question, you know, when I, when I do treatment for patients, whether it's a filling or a crown or whatever, I say to them, today, I have replaced this restoration for you. But from this point onwards, my systems are going to track my own work because everything has an end of life. And I'm going to be the person most likely in 5, 10, 15, or 20 years to remind you that this restoration that I did for you today has reached its end of life. And I will have to replace it for the health of your tooth and for your own well-being. This is another question that I ask my colleagues when I talk to them. How many patients are told by colleagues that my work will come up for replacement? And I'm telling you that today on the day that I place this. And you'll find less than 0.1% say that to the patient. So patients go away with the impression that a filling is there for life or a crown is there for life. 
And this is where the problems lie. The problems lie in that we assume that they know that everything will reach its end of life. Whilst if we say it, they will know that you told them. So I'll move to uh, Sheba, then to Cheryl, and finally, uh, Dr. Dusia would like to say something. So let's go in that order. Sheba. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. I am Professor Head of the Department at D.Y. Patil for Public Health Dentistry. Ethics, I think, goes very much hand in hand with medical legal. So what we are actually discussing is consent of the patient. In today's world, we have to have to take consent. If we do not take consent mm. of the patient, then is where all the other issues come up. That is the point I would like to make. Brilliant. Thank you, Shiba. Thank you, Shiba. I would assume that that's the starting point of any treatment before you pick up Brilliant. any instrument, I would say that it is. However, one can get consent by connivance. One can weigh in with your shoulder and say to a patient, I think this tooth should be extracted rather than present to a patient that a specialist referral is required, root canal and then a crown, which may cost a lot of money because we have been biased by what we might do. And a patient consents to extraction, then realizes that the tooth could be saved or realizes that they have to have an implant and that is far more money. And so consent has to be tempered with full disclosure of what the alternatives are. Because part of ethics is to tell a patient what is going to be, uh, what is going to be the alternatives. Let's move to Cheryl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to add on to what you all were talking about, we need to do what the patient asks us to. So something we've always learned way back in college is the chief complaint. And sadly, I've seen many dentists down the line, they just forget what the chief complaint is. So in I make it a point because in my, in my records, chief complaint, that stays on because it's so important to hear what the patient is I have seen my uh, specialist doctors come in if it's a perio the perio only looks from the gum angle the oral surgeon only looks from an implant or the or, or that angle because that's how th they are trained to do in college but it's so important that we need to figure out the chief complaint and basically work from then and Dr. Trevel I write big sermons in my case papers so it's possible because ah. the complaint what I suggest and what the patient actually agreed on because when they come back that's important yeah but it, it, it's a lot of time but i think it's very worth it overall yeah, thank you dr dusia hi good afternoon can you can you all hear me hey man yes hi yeah as uh, uh you know it's very nice to see dr rodri doctor doctor hey, help me write my uh, you know my uh, culture secretary's uh, report way back in 1980 Anyways, you know, I would like, just like to share my, my, my views. I am, a, I am not an authority. What I'm trying to tell is, he just said something called as, now, I, what I, why I'm telling you this is, I've been working on this for quite some time, and I spoke on the two subjects at the National Maxillofacial Conference also, just, you know, concluded last week. So there's an article 21, uh, which, you know, which entitles a patient his right to do, to decide what should, can be done to his body. Now, right. Article 21 today also is, uh, you know, uh, taken as the right of a patient to his health. Now, I would go to what Dr. Uh, Shiva Gom said. See, the thing is, when you uh, talk about a procedure to a patient, of course, you take a consent. Now, consent should include the procedure you intend to do, everything about the procedure, the anesthesia, the consequences, and then you're also supposed to tell the alternative treatments. And if the patient refuses, they're supposed to take a consent of the refusal of the treatment you are proposing. It is very important to aim. And you know, and, uh, and there are enough, you know, I've been also working with the IDA state, and there are enough uh, cases now with the dental council and IDA. And the point two is, you know, uh, ID, the dental council has revised the code of conduct. That is following the medical council. Now the uh, you know, 2012, they modified. 2014, 
is the modified document as dr pereira said on the net dci talking explicitly about the you know what we should do and we should not do uh, i think all of us should go through that and i still feel and i agree with dr victor rodriguez it is the patient who decides if he doesn't want to do your treatment you can take his refusal and tell if you are not going to do this 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 can happen and of course once you have a consent properly taken uh, no one can you know even in the court of law can contest your uh, treatment that's what i feel i'm not on sort of your thought thank you thank you dr dusia pleasure thank to you, hear sir. you again it's been a long time since i know But, uh, yeah Thank I'm so happy. Now, so a lot of people in my, you know, so I am, I am happy that I know Dr. Rodriguez and I know Dr. Maybe Pereira and Dr. Jital Pierce also, you know. So I <laughs> now know what is my span in the field of dentistry, and uh, I've had lovely times with Dr. Rodriguez. I know also. Dr. Heman too as a wonderful person. Dr. <laughs> Heman, coming back to this revised thing, it was done in 2014, and it sir, was sir. written by retired Colonel Dr. S. K. Oja. was then the officiating secretary of the dental council of india and it is freely available these are the revised ethical code of conduct yes, right one should read that that was done uh, in 2014 i can send that you know a copy of that to dr travel perera so that he can share uh, i can i can other. i can pass it on to travel it will be worth it for the younger i know travel i'll get it from uh, cheryl or sharon okay. i can send it to Doctor so, Korea, there are some. Data. Sorry, there are some questions on the chat. Would you like to take them? You asking me? No, Doctor no. Korea. Yeah. Uh, should we disclose the charges of dental treatments to attract patients in the marketing process? Is that ethical in any manner? This is raised by Doctor Jyoti. So, how do you discuss my my question counter? How do you uh, display this? What in the newspaper? You can take an ad in the newspaper to say that uh, these are my charges. No. What is the difference between having uh, the charges as a tab on your website or in a newspaper? What is the difference? They are both called publications. They are both freely available to anybody who wants to see them. so what is the difference is it ethical or is it unethical to put charges there travel so um, uh, i i think if you want to display your charges it is better to dis display it in your clinic i mean when a patient enters your clinic your charges are displayed and if the patient is wants to know about it i think displaying it on newspapers or uh, or uh, i think even if you have your own website so there are many clinics will have their own website yeah. and if you click on that website and your charges are displayed there i think that's i think i'm okay with i think that's okay i do not know whether the council will approve of that i have not seen anyone's charges displayed on any website as such but yes in clinics it is and newspapers it comes which i'm totally against i mean when i see that a, the cost of treatment is at uh you know the cheapest dental implant put here or put there i i don't agree to that kind of stuff but in your own clinic if you display it or if you have your own website which is displaying your charges i uh, i think that's okay i do not know whether the i don't know whether the council uh, will disapprove of it well in in different in different countries we have different standards and uh, and so marketing and advertising is different in different countries um and uh, i think displaying your prices uh, in new zealand for example is is perfectly fine on your website uh but uh, we do have occasionally um dentists putting huge billboards to say that cheapest implant uh, clinic in new zealand along the highway along the motorway so we see that uh and uh, unfortunately uh it's counterproductive because people uh, don't appreciate that you know new zealand is a strange place actually but uh, it's uh, everything about fairness and cricket so uh, they don't like you know when somebody says my backside is more red than anybody else's so uh 
that's how. This displaying, uh, Vikram says that displaying charges should be okay as long as the dentist abides by these charges. Otherwise, it is false advertising. I totally agree. If the dentist wants to take the risk of saying that some procedure will cost a certain amount of money and then it becomes far more complicated, it is false advertising. But is there a forum in India that allows you to take it further? Travel. Um, uh, as far as I know, the council uh, will not permit you to advertise in newspapers. So when it is done, there are there are there are uh, associations which take action against such a situation where a dentist has displayed his charges or writing it as cheap implants in uh, newspapers or on any boards which are put up outside away from the clinic. You can have your charges displayed within your clinic and that's well within your preview. So I think that is okay. But I've had, I've heard of situations where uh, th this has happened in Ghatkopar, it has happened in Kandivli, where the associations have taken an action against people putting up the charges in newspaper ads. Yep. Uh, Vikram says, I think there seems to be confusion between marketing versus false advertising. Anik, and uh, he, he says, you know, Salman Khan advertising a practice is marketing uh, and it's not false advertising. <laughs> just, for the rec just for the record, Salman Khan started as a patient in my practice before his, uh, before his mama came back from Germany. And uh, Salman was only in school at that time in Stanislaus when I was there. So uh, it's been a long time when I saw his name. It reminded me of that time. Uh, yes, I do believe that uh, taking uh, in today's social media, taking photographs with uh, famous personalities in your practice is a little unethical, but it's not unacceptable. Um, as long as it doesn't says, you know, endorse that I'm the best dentist in the world and everybody else is, is terrible. I think uh, it's just the way the world is going now with social media and TikTok and all of that. Uh, how are we go ahead, Roy? Uh, we have fortunately a few celebrities, right? But we take pictures. But I personally will never post that picture on social media. However, Absolutely. what happened with me? The celebrity herself has posted it on social media, right? And I, I That's fine. Do you you have that no control over good. what other and people I have, have no, no control. No, no, she's a victim. I want to do it. And she has done it. And I have I've shared it. Okay. But uh, this is a yeah. political uh, celebrity. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to, we talked about specialists and things like that. I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes and just explain to you what happened. There was recently uh, a, a dentist in New Zealand, a, almost lost uh, her license in New Zealand for something like this. A patient walked in into her practice and said, um, my teeth are getting worn down. I would like to have my, my teeth fixed. And she said, you know what? You need a full mouth rehabilitation. So she referred the patient to the periodontist. She referred the patient to the orthodontist. She referred the patient to the oral surgeon. And she was merely a post office where all of this happened. Finally, the patient came back and she had to do a bit of work and, uh, and to finish the case, but things began to go horribly wrong. When the matter went before the dental council in the peer review in New Zealand, the decision went against her and she almost lost her license because the, the decision was that when you refer a patient to a specialist, that patient is going there on your recommendation. So if you send the patient, you just refer the patient to the specialist for perio work or for for prosthetic work or for whatever it is, you as the general dentist are the conductor. It's not a band of people playing different instruments. You are the most important person to tell the specialist what exact outcome you want. And it's only when they agree to your outcome does the work go ahead. And this has come up time and time again, where den general dentists think that just by merely referring a patient to a specialist, the job's done. <laughs> But it's not that way. 
And so it is very important to remember that the general dentist actually is the most important part in a complex rehabilitation case where there is many factors, many specialists getting involved. It's not good enough to just merely refer the patient and think that job's done. So I thought I'd share that with you because this has been a, a, a mainstay, especially in, in, in group practices, because I have a group practice. It, I have to make sure mm -hmm. that my colleagues re realize that they, they, have to, they are ultimately responsible for what the specialist mm -hmm. does. And, um, and, uh, and that's really the ethical part of who ultimately has the responsibility for this. Are there any other questions? One last question, Thomas Lobo. Yep, go ahead. I can't see the question. Yeah, I'll answer. So, fear of dental checkup has been exacerbated by cases where a, where a tooth has been on investigation diagnosed as cancerous, resulting in major jaw surgery. How would you address these issues? Uh, are you saying that the, 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 the patient did not have uh, an oral cancer and it was a misdiagnosis, or are you saying that it was? Thomas, would you like to start? Thomas? Is Thomas there? Yeah, he's there. Thomas on mute. Okay, uh, the the patient uh, had no idea that uh, the tooth had turned cancerous, and uh, subsequently, after the diagnosis and the surgery, it has created some sort of fear psychosis amongst those who have who have been interacting with him. You know, approaching a dentist. You know, uh, I know it's irrational, but this is the way people people perceive. Uh, a situation like that. So, uh, can I just uh, try to answer that? Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, yes, uh, so um, uh, where I had a patient who came to me with um, an ulcer on the, like, you know, buccal mucosa which was uh, because of a sharp tooth, okay? And that tooth, um, that the, the ulcer did not appear to be quite normal. It looked cancerous to me. And since I'm an oral pathologist, I told the patient that we'll have to take a biopsy, but first we will just, uh, uh, after we do the biopsy of the, because he came to me with the tooth problem, not with the ulcer. The primary cause was, just that the tooth was paining him. So I told him that, see, I cannot treat your tooth because if I treat your tooth, I fear that that ulcer, which is there in the buccal mucosa would probably exacerbate and turn into frank carcinoma. So he walked away. Okay. He did not get his treatment done. He said, no, I want you to remove my tooth. I said, I will not remove it. So he went to another dentist, got it removed. Okay and comes back within a month with Frank C and tells me now it was, it was my good luck that the patient had come to me initially and then gone to another dentist. So I could understand what was the case about, but the patient comes back to me and tells me that I have removed the tooth and now this has come up. So I pointed out to the patient that you have come to me a month back and you had insisted that I remove your tooth and it would, uh, uh, I did not do it, which he understood. Now, this patient was very understanding. So because of that, because he wanted to make a legal implication of this on that dentist. And I told him the dentist has nothing to do with it. Your problem is primarily because of the tooth that you had oral cancer right in the beginning and the extraction of the tooth just aggravated the cancer, which was there. So this is my take that if the patient has explained about it, and told what has happened, but then the situation can be kept under control. 
Yeah, thanks, doctor. In this particular case, the patient accepted the situation uh, as something that oh. has resulted from uh, it's no fault of his nor of the doctor, but the people around his family members, his contacts, and all has created some sort of fear psychosis about situations like this, where a mere toothache can result into a major, major issue like this. Yeah, I understand what you say. That is why in that case also, because I did not have only that patient, I had his family come to me and they wanted me because I'm an oral pathologist and I had diagnosed it as, a, as oral cancer. They told me that you have to come with us and explain. I said, no, you are, uh, the fault is not with the dentist. Okay. I explained to him that you already had pre-existing oral cancer. And that got aggravated because of removing the tooth. If you had not removed the tooth, this would have still progressed. And I made the family understand, but I did not go and interact with the dentist who had removed it. I made the patient understand. Finally, the patient got treated also for cancer. So, I mean, these situations take place. I mean, I've had many patients come to me for oral cancer in such situations where they had got a tooth extracted and you know, the cancer progressed, but it doesn't happen like that. It is just that the cancer already pre-existed unless there was a sharp edge of the tooth. I've had patients who have even had oral cancer with just a, a sharp edge of the tooth, constantly irritating the buccal mucosa over a period of say a year or so, which finally turns into cancer with no habits. And that we see quite frequently now in the last four, five years or whatever, seven, eight years, which was not seen previously you know, non-habit related oral cancer. So that has to be tackled also to told, I mean, that family was devastated because that lady was treated for tongue cancer. She had her part of her tongue removed because of the constant irritation because of the tooth and the entire family is paranoid about having any sharp edges on the tooth. So I've had not only family, I've had even her close by neighbors, relatives who come to me telling me that the tooth is sharp just see what is wrong. Ho sakta hai kya, cancer hai kya. Because I know and they, and they relate it to that person. So that phobia will always exist when people know that you can get oral cancer even because of uh, non-habit, uh, you know, non-habit related uh, illnesses. Yeah. Thank, thanks, thanks, doctor, for the elaborate uh, clarification. Thank you. A question uh, from Trupti is, is ethics a part of curriculum in dental schools? Yes, ethics is a part of dental curriculum. And if I think Shiba Gomes is there online still, probably she will be able to tell. They, they, they do have a class, they do have a lecture and dental ethics is taught in public health dentistry. We have a subject called as public health dentistry and uh, or community dentistry. So in that, dental ethics is a part of it. Not only is it taught, um, it is case, dis I mean, case discussions also happen at my end. So we are, it is a part of the DCI requirement for MDS as well as BDS. Right, thank you, Shiba. I think e ethics is, uh, can never be legislated. You can never write a law which co covers ethics. Ethics is morality. It's the understanding of right and wrong. It's the understanding of uh, another human being's needs. And whilst we can have case studies and examples, we can have discussions, it's always down to the, the, the interaction between a patient and the treatment provider. And ethical considerations um, have to amplify the relationship between the two for the well being of each other. And I think that's very, very important. And uh, it is, uh, it is uh, significantly uh, more complex these days as society itself becomes more complex. I'll give you an example. A mother brought her daughter to me for treatment and uh, I was about to take bite wing x-rays. The, the, the daughter is, was 15 years old. 
So the mother was sitting in the room and you can actually see my room behind me. Uh, there's a chair there where the mother was sitting. And so I told the mother to please step out because we were going to take bite wing x-rays. As the mother stepped out, the child told, the, the daughter who's 15 years old told me, doctor, I wanted to tell you that I'm pregnant. I've not written it on my form. Now, I've already told the mother to step out of the room. I'm about to take an x-ray. What do I do? Who would like to answer that question? I'd, I'd like Sheba to answer that question. Because Sheba is, uh, is in a position of authority here. What action should the dentist, what action should I take? You have a 15 year old daughter in the chair, mother standing outside waiting for x-rays to be taken. The daughter tells me she's pregnant. Personally, what I would have done is I would tell the daughter that, you know, it is my legal, means legally, I should be informing the mother about this. You know, so I would take her permission whether I should uh, be talking to the mother as well about this and then the precautions, whatever needed for taking the x-ray. So I would take her permission first and then I would, I mean, if she agrees, I would talk. Otherwise, I would not take that x-ray because the child is also 15 and under 18. So I would look at it as a child. So I would not do it. But I would ask permission from the child, but you know, that I need to tell your mother about this. And if she says yes, then otherwise I would ask the child to talk to her mother and then get back. That is how I would have dealt with it. Right. I'm not allowed to do that in New Zealand. Oh. So I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to uh, to put the child in a, in a, to put the child in a position where. Uh, uh, she has to choose now because she's not got pregnant in my room. She's been pregnant for several weeks. So my action would precipitate a conflict between a child who does not wish to, and I, I don't have the time to be able to discuss with her, do you have a counselor? Do you have, have you talked about this to somebody in school? Because the mother is standing right outside my room and the door is open. And therefore, I, we don't, I don't have that right. And so therefore, I had to say that um, I've chosen not to take x-rays and I will only take high definition photographs at this appointment, but I'll take x-rays at the next appointment. I've changed my mind. And then I advised the, pair, the child that, look, you have to seek help, but I cannot get into the discussion of whether I should tell the mother or whether I can have her consent to tell her mother. I could lose my license for that. Oh. It's a complex world. And can I just add one more thing? See, when we talk ethics, it's not just ethics between you and the patient. It is also ethics between you and professional colleagues. So, you know, today that is also coming into play. So in today, there are multiple cases when we say case study and ethics. No, there are cases where a dentist is bad mouthing another dentist. So there again, ethics, no, the, there's an add on of ethics. And DCI clearly says, you know, how dentists behave with a patient, dentists behave with each other and dentists behave in the community. So just adding on to that point, which was discussed earlier. Yes. We, we tend, we tend to be free with disclosing personal stuff with parents and, and others and colleagues uh, without realizing that it, it breaks the law, it breaks ethics, uh, standards, you know? So uh, I've seen that happen. Uh, did you know that so-and-so uh, uh, has gone to hospital? Uh, that's wrong to disclose somebody else's health information. Um, a, a dad calls up to say, 
I'm sending my daughter to you for treatment. Let me know what was done. That's not allowed. Uh, oh, I'm paying the bill, but that has nothing to do with the information. So it's a complex world out there. It's a complex world and, the, and, and, and it's getting more and more complex by the day. And uh, I think it's, this is a wonderful topic that has been covered because um, there's such a wide range of ages on this forum, um, each of which uh, each age uh, has brought its own set of uh, issues to the, to the surface. Uh, I think we've gone on for quite a while. And uh, if there's no more questions, uh, I think I will give the floor to Cheryl for a vote of thanks. And um, yeah, I just like we to can call it a Dr. day. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Cheryl is a practicing dentist in Bandra. She's part of this alumni and has done the FIA and biomedical ethics course. She's also been ex-secretary of St. Luke's Medical Guild for two years and a very good friend of mine. Uh, I'd ask her to take, do the vote of thanks, please. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you, FIAM, for having me do this vote of thanks. I'm actually honored to be among the big boys, as I call them. They are actually legendary, though they are not. Dr. Loyola is not here with us, but he's left his mark all over the industry, sure. especially in Bandra. And I'm, I'm happy to be on this platform with two Bandra boys, Dr. Victor and Dr. Loyola. And of course, our sweet, sweet Belapur boy, Dr. Treville, who's really sweet. Uh, Dr. Victor, you totally crown dental ethics, just like you do with your music. And your doc, you're definitely not Stone Age. I think our generation needs stones to fall on our heads for us to open our eyes and follow and do as you have imparted today. You've totally touched on all aspects and avenues. I mean, right from greeting the patient to unethical uh, designations, which we take so lightly, which is an eye opener. And we'll make sure, yeah, we do good and no harm. I know, yes, sir. my most important takeaway is after that Wednesday night, late Bandra gym night, I have to be on time for my morning appointment. <laughs> I have to definitely work on that because as you said, my time is as important as my patient's time. Dr. Travel, thank you thank for taking you very us. Much. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Travel, thank you for taking us Sunday marketing. They're very, uh, very differently put in and... Uh, an eye opener basically to market ethically and teaching us right from long. So for me, I come from a family of doctors who are very age old and very anti-marketing. So it was always <laughs> word of mouth, referrals, it's your patients will bring you patients. Uh, something that really struck me, what you said was, uh, it's an obligation as a dentist that I should reach out to my community. So I have a very communal, friendly neighborhood practice in Bandra, and I don't go beyond my bounds. I, I, maybe I'm lazy, so say God, but I also don't market. But you have opened this to me that marketing is not unethical, and we can, I mean, we can reach out. It's our obligation. So if you're a good dentist, like you said, let, let the world know. So it's time to change that approach, the ethical way. So thank you, Trevel. Uh, Dr. Loyola Korea, Korea, you excellent in your moderation. You shared so much all the way from New Zealand. And uh, I think New Zealand to Bombay, ethics is ethics. I mean, it's it's amazing. All, all your case studies, what you shared is, uh, is awakened us. And there's so much of learning. I am happy and I'm privileged being a dentist from Bandra. I have seen your work, your 25 years old fillings, believe me, are still going strong. I think it's the ethical work of yours that's actually going strong. So thank you, Dr. Loyola. And thank you for, thank you. Uh, thank you for making us realize the expression of gratitude. I mean, we take that so lightly. So I think that's the icing on the cake where we want to take the word of mouth forward, express the gratitude, and that, that can be our journey onwards. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sharon, for uh, being a silent worker behind the scenes. What you, you do, what you do so well, coordinating this whole thing. PM is blessed to have you, Sharon. 
special thanks to fiam and all the board of trustees a special thanks to dr nicholas anta who gives so much of himself to this organization dr ruen masquerinus the secretary his meticulous work really gives us so much and we learn so much from fiam dr jazel my dear friend treasurer of fiam you work with your heart thank you for that all the fiam students here today past alumni and present thank you for joining us st luke's medical gill thank you for being here and the dentist i i i heard some very senior dentist dr sheba and all i mean you all give us such good inputs thank you for giving us your sunday morning and we learn so much from your contribution and sharing thank you all listeners without you all today would not be successful thank you for giving us your sunday morning thank you all god bless fm and thank, thank you. you all and bye -bye. i leave thank you, you from across the world hello good night yep. good night and goodbye have a good day everybody hello good